Animal food in general is a good source of protein because it has a lot of highly bioavailable proteins and it also has a very high protein quality. All the essential amino acids we need and in the right proportions. If you think about it, our requirement for amino acids roughly reflects the amino acidic composition of our own body. Because in the end, that is what we need to build and maintain our tissues. So it makes sense that animal food has a high protein quality for us because its composition is similar to ourselves. If we were cannibals, we would probably say that human meat has the highest protein quality for humans. But since luckily we don't eat each other, then the next closest thing we have is turning to other animal sources of protein. The numbers you see here are percent weight. So 100 grams of eggs contains about 13 grams of protein. Meat, 15 to 20 percent. Fish, about the same. Tuna has a little bit more. Milk and yogurt, 3 percent. It doesn't look much, but remember that they have a lot of water. So if you look at how much of their energy comes from protein, that's actually quite a lot. Cheese concentrates that protein up to 25 to 35 percent. However, like we said at the beginning of our protein section, animal food is not the only source of proteins. Nuts and seeds, for example, are very good sources of protein. They have between 20 and 26 grams of proteins per 100 grams, and a pretty good protein quality, not as good as the animal sources. They could use a touch of extra lysine, but overall it's very good. However, they are very energy-dense foods, so we can only eat so much, and we certainly couldn't get all of our proteins from them. We can get some from cereals. As long as they are whole grains, they also have quite a lot of protein. Not as much as nuts and seeds, but keep in mind that we eat more. A serving of pasta is of course bigger than a serving of sunflower seeds. They also have a composition that's surprisingly close to the animal sources of protein. However, they have one big problem. They have only one third of the lysine we need, and this dramatically lowers their protein quality. This means that if we were to eat only cereals as our sources of protein, we would not be able to use most of that protein because it lacks this one essential amino acid. The protein content of whole grain cereals is between 8 and 15 percent, oats being the richest source. The pseudo cereals quinoa and amaranth also have a little bit more and they also have more lysine so their protein quality is slightly better too. And then we have legumes. Legumes also have a very good protein content, much higher than cereals, ranging between 20 and 26 percent. But legumes also have a problem of protein quality. The lacking amino acids this time are the sulfur-containing ones, methionine, which is essential, and cysteine, which is conditionally essential. So just like grains, we could not rely on legumes alone as protein sources in our diet. Soy and soy products are exceptional sources of vegetable protein, with 36% that ends up being even more than meat. Besides having higher protein content, they also have more methionine and cysteine, and thus a much better protein quality compared to that of other legumes. Many nutritionists actually consider soy protein to be complete. Fruits and vegetables have good protein quality, but they have very low protein amounts. Fruit is less than 1%, vegetables are slightly higher but still less than 3%, so they certainly contribute to our protein requirement, but we could never get all the protein we need from vegetables alone. We need to eat tons. And then we have some alternative sources of proteins. Tofu from soy, tempeh from soy, corn from a fungus that has a lot of fairly good protein, seitan made from wheat's gluten, protein isolates such as milk's whey proteins, egg whites, and soy. And then let's not forget that in other parts of the world people will eat insects, bugs and larvae, good sources of protein, cheap and pretty much tasteless. One important concept that we need to understand is that of complementary proteins. We have just surveyed protein content and quality of different food sources. And we have said, okay, these are high quality, these are low quality sources of protein, but let's not forget that the protein quality of foods individually is only marginally relevant. When we eat, 
we don't really care about the protein quality of a single food. What we care about is the protein quality of the whole meal, so the combination of food that we eat. And so if we combine two or more low quality protein sources in the right way, and if we eat them together, not necessarily in the same dish, but at the same meal, then we can compensate from essential amino acids deficiencies and come up with a high protein quality meal. To clarify this very important concept, let's make a little example. Imagine one more time that we need to build our little tripeptide, a protein made of three amino acids. And this time I didn't even write the names, we just have the colors. We need to build a protein made with one green amino acid, one orange amino acid, and one blue amino acid. And now imagine we have this food, food one, that contains 30 amino acids, 10 green, 10 orange, and 10 blue. How many copies of our protein can we build with this pool of amino acids? Well, pretty easy. We can build 10, right? We take 1, 1, and 1 for 10 times. So we can make 10 copies of the protein that we need. So we could say that the protein value of this food is 10. This food is a high quality protein food because it has all the amino acids that we need in just the right proportions. We will be able to use all of them and make the protein that we need. But now imagine that we ate another food, food 2. Now the proportions of the different amino acids have changed. This time we have 10 green amino acids, 18 orange and 2 blue. Notice that the total protein content is the same as food 1. We still have 30 total amino acids. So the grams of total protein in these two foods would be the same. But now how many copies of our protein can we build? Obviously we can only make 2 because after that we will be out of the blue amino acid and we will not be able to build any more copies of the protein that we need. So we will build only two copies. We can say that the protein value of this food is only two and that blue is the limiting amino acid. We don't have enough to keep going with our protein synthesis. On top of that, we are left with eight green and 16 orange amino acids. But because we don't have any way to store extra amino acids, we will have to throw them away by using them for energy or converting them to fat. And now let's consider food 3. Again, the total amount of protein is still the same. We still have 30 amino acids. But now we have a lot of blue and only two of the orange amino acid. Again, we can only make two copies of our protein. Then this time the orange will become limiting and we will have to throw away 8 green and 16 blue amino acids. The protein value of food 3 is also only 2. So same protein content as food 1, but much lower quality. But now imagine that we eat food 2 and food 3 together, and I half the amount of each because I want the total protein content to stay the same. So we eat half the amount of food 2 and half the amount of food 3. And again we have 30 total amino acids. But now the lack of orange in food 3 will be compensated by food 2, and the lack of blue in food 2 will be compensated by food 3. So how many copies of our protein can we now build? We have 10 green, 10 orange, and 10 blue amino acids, so now we can again build 10 copies of our protein, and we don't have anything to discard. Because of the way these two low-quality foods mutually integrate each other, they complement each other and result in a high protein quality meal. The protein value of the combination of these two foods is now 10. Notice that 10 is more than just the sum of the individual protein values of the single foods. If we had eaten one at lunch and one at dinner, the total protein quality would have only been 2 plus 2, 4. But by eating them together, because of the way they integrate each other, then we have a much higher protein value. The most important practical application of this concept is the combination of grains and legumes, the typical case of complementary proteins. Remember how we said that grains have a very good proportion of amino acids except for one, they lack lysine. But they have a lot of methionine and cysteine. Instead legumes, they have low methionine and cysteine, but they have all the lysine. If we eat them together in the right proportions, which is about two-thirds grains and one-third legumes, they complement each other and provide all the amino acids we need.
So if I eat them alone, if I only eat a slice of whole wheat bread, or if I only eat a spoon of chickpeas hummus, the protein quality would be low. But if I put my hummus on my slice of bread, then they will complement each other and I will have the same protein quality that I would have had with a steak. Since we're talking hummus, another good way to complement it is to add sesame paste to the hummus itself. 